Jesse James, a youthful-looking man with piercing blue eyes and a solemn face, is sitting on his horse surveying his victory, the wind carrying the coppery smell of blood into his nostrils. At his side is the tyrant known as Bloody Bill, an American psychopath of the first degree, a man whose short life was dictated by violence. James wipes a bloodied knife against his pants. Almost 80 men are surrounding him, cheering, holding up trophies ripped from the 120 or so Union soldiers they've just slain. One man screams like a banshee while holding a dead man's scalp in the air, air that's still tainted with clouds of gun smoke. Another man slips a nose into his pocket. To his right, his comrade is slicing off an ear. This is the sound of victory. James is content. He's killed the leading officer. This is his time, or so he thinks. He can't possibly know he'll become one of the most well-known and divisive outlaws in American history. Was Jesse James a great American outlaw? A kind of Robin Hood type criminal who only fought back against the authorities that had hurt him and his kind? Was he merely a product of his surroundings, a pawn in a political game he could not understand? Or was he just a ruthless psychopathic criminal who didn't have an ounce of goodness in him? It's a topic that divides people to this day, so watch this episode and make your own mind up. This is his story, a gripping tale if there ever was one. Jesse Woodson James was born on September 5, 1847, to Zerelda Cole James and Robert James. He had two full siblings, an elder brother, Alexander Franklin Frank James, and a younger sister, Susan Lavinia James. The family, it's said, were of English and Welsh descent. Robert James was a slave-holding preacher who didn't exactly embrace the abolitionist movement. He died when James was only three years old after going to California in search of gold. He left his wife facing the possibility of poverty, although she married again, first to a Mr. Benjamin Sims, then to a Reuben Samuel. With her last husband, she acquired seven slaves to work a tobacco plantation they owned. With their farm, they had a fairly comfortable existence. It looked to them that their children would grow up without the difficulties the very poor were cursed with. But times in the U.S. were changing, and not to the James family's liking. The Jameses saw themselves as hard-working pioneers who worked their fingers to the bone to make a living in the vast rural areas of the country, and they also didn't have any scruples about owning slaves. Many people on the other side of the border did, and that's what led to the outbreak of the Kansas-Missouri Border War in 1854. This would become a hostile and bloody conflict that would span five years, and the James family would very much be embroiled in it. More so because Clay County, where they lived, had a larger population of slaves than the average county in Missouri. And of course, the Jameses made their money on the backs of the unfortunate enslaved. They stood firm on the side of the pro-slave so-called border ruffians who went over the borderline to Kansas to cause mayhem. The Jameses' slaves were a valuable asset to them, accounting for close to half of their wealth. In their eyes, their human property was theirs, and no government was going to tell them how they should live their life. Then in 1861, the American Civil War began, a war between the Union and Confederate armies that would claim the lives of almost three quarters of a million soldiers, as well as countless civilians. Still today, it's the deadliest war in U.S. history. Union soldiers became an occupying force in Clay County. And while there was support for the Union, there was more support for the Confederates. It was a recipe for bloodshed. Confederate guerrillas hunted down people they called traitors. Houses of Confederates were raided in the middle of the night by Unionist militias. Folks were summarily killed on both sides for their beliefs. People like the James family who supported the Southern cause could at any time find themselves at the hands of a savage militia, dragged outside their house and strung up from the trees, while with their last few breaths they saw their homes burn to the ground. If something like that happened, which it did many times, then Confederate mobs returned the violence on folks they deemed the enemy. This was the environment Jesse James grew up in. This mayhem was the genesis of a brutal criminal career. One day, James's stepfather was tortured within an inch of his life after being hanged from a beam. His mother was arrested too, and all this happened in front of Jesse's eyes. As the story goes, Jesse, just 16 years old, was whipped during the ordeal. The reason for the violence was James's brother Frank was running with a guerrilla group and a bloodthirsty one at that. After that, the mother swore an oath of allegiance to the Union, signing on the dotted line with her teeth clenched and revenge on her mind. Later that night, whispering in her children's ears, she spilled out her hatred for the people that had destroyed their family. Vengeance will be yours, she said to the boys, and they heard it loud and clear. And vengeance they got, in the most brutal fashion. They joined the bushwhacker guerrillas with the intent to kill as many of the enemy as they could. Their reign of terror was not an order from above. They had no commander outside their own murderous coterie. Revenge was all they needed, and when they got it, they wanted everyone to know what damage they'd done. Their campaign was designed to instill fear in their enemy, hence their propensity for mutilation. 
This bloodlust culminated with the Centralia Massacre, the end of which we discussed in the intro. In the morning of that massacre, 80 or so guerrillas, including Frank and Jesse James, rode into the town of Centralia, Missouri. After looting the town and drinking copious amounts of whiskey, the men boarded a train they'd blocked on the track. There, they massacred and mutilated 24 unarmed Union soldiers that were returning home from the war. The bushwhackers rode out of town, leaving a train carriage in flames behind them. At around 3 in the afternoon that same day, a Union infantry major without much military experience took 146 men from a 39th Missouri Infantry Regiment to the town. The residents warned them about the force they might be met with, but the major ordered his men to stay put. Soon the guerrillas arrived on horseback, each carrying a number of pistols, precluding the need to reload. It was hardly a battle. The Union soldiers fired their guns and a handful of guerrillas were killed, but after that they were encircled and shot to pieces from all sides. A few got away, but most were killed quickly. Those who laid injured on the floor were finished off, being given no quarter even though their hands were up. The Union was furious. The bushwhackers were a force to contend with, not just some yokels with a gripe. The order came down to show no mercy. This is what one high-ranking Union officer wrote. Depopulation and devastation are extreme measures, but if this infernal warfare continues, it'll be humane and economic of human life to adopt and vigorously enforce such measures wherever the bushwhackers have more friends than the government. So widespread was the violence that Union General Thomas Ewing Jr. demanded the entire depopulation of four counties, which included every last man, woman, and child, regardless of their views. Entire families were dragged from their homes, they were stripped of their livelihoods, and they were forced to fend for themselves someplace else. After they were removed, the order decreed that everything should be destroyed and burned, even the animals on the farms. It was a dark moment in American history, and something Jesse James would never forget. This order, called Order No. 11, was intended to reduce the material support the Confederate guerrillas were receiving from people in those counties, but it was a myopic move, because the displaced and bitter only supported the guerrillas more after that. They were further embittered when occasionally they walked through towns only to see Confederate sympathizers hanging from beams on porches. On the other side of the coin, supporters of the Union were shot down like wild animals. The war came to an end in 1865 after Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Ulysses S. Grant at the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse. A month later, James was seriously injured trying to surrender to Union men. As he'd earlier done to them, instead of doing the right thing, they put a bullet in his chest. This was actually the second time he almost died after being shot. Needless to say, here was an angry young man. The Civil War might have ended, but that didn't mean the differences of people in the state didn't remain. Folks were still just as divided, and that meant more violence to come. New laws devised by anti-slavery Republicans were not so kind to the pro-slavery folks that most aligned with the Democrats. And before you go ranting in the comments section, keep in mind both parties have switched ideological positions so frequently that neither one resembles what they were after the Civil War. The upshot of this situation was that former Confederates couldn't vote. Neither could they serve on juries or even preach in churches, this item being something of great importance in those days. As we know now from looking at history, when the victors are too oppressive to the losers, the outcome is usually just the losers uniting and forming another kind of beast. It's a complicated tale, but let's just say that the marauding gangs of violent guerrillas didn't just hang up their gloves and do what they were told. James had some downtime convalescing from the injury that nearly killed him. His nurse for much of that time was his first cousin, Zerelda Z. Mims. The two dated and courted for a number of years until they were married. In time, they had two kids together. That might sound romantic if not a bit incestual, but what's more important is that all this time James had vengeance on his mind. He was about to become a hero to some and a villain to others. On February 13, 1866, he and his bushwhacker gang were about to commit a crime against the Republican authorities that they despise so much. They rode into Liberty, Missouri that day and successfully committed what's now called the first daytime bank robbery ever in the U.S. The bank, the Clay County Savings Association, was owned by outspoken Republicans who just before held the first Republican rally in Clay County. Of course, the money was one objective, but so was stealing from the other side. An innocent person lost his life that day, something that would happen time and again during the James Gang robberies. We should add that some people think James wasn't involved in the crime, but you can say that for a lot of the crimes he was accused of committing. Other gangs that supported the Confederate cause were also causing mayhem, but they were often reduced in size when the law got hold of them or posses of men decided to lynch them. When that happened, some of the gangs joined together to have strength in numbers. It's thought that James Gang and members from another gang robbed another bank on May 23, 1867, and in doing so they shot the local mayor and two other people. 
During this amalgamation of gangs, Jesse James was still not a household name, and in no way was his face on the front pages of New York newspapers. But then, on December 7, 1869, James' brother Frank and other members of the gang cemented their infamy. They walked into the Davies County Savings Association in Gallatin, Missouri, and after taking a minimal amount of cash, killed a totally innocent cashier. James said that happened as revenge for the killing of Bloody Bill, since it was mistakenly thought that the cashier was the officer that killed him. He was just a guy doing his job. James was now an outlaw with a bounty on his head. He was dubbed the last surviving murderous bushwhacker, although as you can imagine after watching so far, he was cheered on by a lot of people in Missouri and beyond. James's fame grew when he befriended the editor of the Kansas City Times, one John Newman Edwards. Edwards didn't exactly paint a picture of a mindless killer when writing about James, but of a loyal confederate who faced harsh times. In those editorials, James looked like an innocent man, but that was far from the truth. When the James gang hooked up with another group of loyal confederates, the Younger Gang, they were an outfit to be reckoned with. Together, they moved across states in the U.S., robbing numerous banks and stagecoaches, and as strange as it sounds, they were sometimes admired by the locals that saw them at work. They even acted out for the locals at times right after a robbery. You could say the gangs were the very first celebrity criminals in the U.S., but were they truly bad people? Well, when they turned to trains as a means of making money, they didn't rob the passengers and instead concentrated on the safes. Okay, so they robbed the passengers a couple of times, but in the vast majority of the robberies, they left the regular folks alone, if not occasionally hurting people working on the train. It was after this spat of robberies that James's friend at the newspaper started making out that he was some kind of Robin Hood character, since the stolen cash belonged to banks and businesses, in today's parlance, the ruling elite. An anonymous letter once appeared in the paper that read, We are not thieves, we are bold robbers. We rob from the rich and give to the poor. The truth is, though, while some people bought into this, the gang never shared the spoils with the needy. At this point, James had amassed a fair bit of cash, but he'd also awoken a beast in the authorities from Missouri all the way to Washington. They were outraged that a killer and a thief who seemed to have no regard for human life was supported by a great many people in America. His gang had also robbed so many trains, the train companies were afraid to run. It was those companies that asked for help from a Scottish detective named Alan Pinkerton, the man behind the Pinkerton Agency, an outfit that had once saved the life of President-elect Abraham Lincoln. It became the biggest private detective agency in the world, and it thought it could easily get rid of uneducated train robbers in the South. Jesse James had other ideas. The agency sent one of their highly trained men named Joseph Wincher down to Missouri to take out the leaders of the gang, but what they didn't know is that James had many friends in his locale people who'd help the gang after their many robberies. They'd hide them, feed them, and even give them horses. Word soon got out that a new man in town that didn't look too local had been asking about the James farm. Could one man really succeed where local police had already failed multiple times? With a hot tip that the James gang was holed up in a local farm, the agent was warned by the sheriff that if he went to that farm, he'd not come back. The agent disagreed, and bravely or stupidly, he headed off to the farm. The next day, his body was discovered with four bullet holes in the chest and two in the head. He'd been bound and tortured and later wild hogs had made a feast on the corpse. His body had a note that read, this is what happens to all detectives. Three other Pinkerton detectives and a local sheriff were sent to go after the younger brothers, Cole, Jim, John, and Bob, and only one detective made it back to Chicago. One agent had his hat shot off, which was a miss, not great gunsmanship. He survived. John Younger was also killed in the gunfight. Back in Chicago, the fierce and fearless Alan Pinkerton, who had a rough life himself, was infuriated. He sent four of his best men down to deal with a bunch of bushwhackers, and only one had returned. Let's not forget, this was an agency that claimed to never sleep, and proudly said it used tactics as well as brawn. Pinkerton had never known defeat, and so with his own cash, he made it his personal mission to rid the world of Jesse James and the gang. He had his own message for James too. When we meet, it must be the death of one or both of us. Pinkerton didn't send any more men until he was sure he had an ally in the local town. Then on January 25, 1875, Pinkerton detectives arrived at the farm armed with explosives. A bomb was thrown into the house, which killed James's younger half-brother immediately. The blast also blew off the mother's arm, but Jesse and Frank were nowhere to be seen. Even in those days, the attack on the farm was seen as unethical. How did they know who was in the house? They killed a brother that wasn't part of the gang, and they maimed an innocent mother. Alan Pinkerton denied the intent was to burn the house down, but we now know it was because of a letter that was later discovered. The act was quite simply murder with intent. 
It was hard to not feel sorry for the James family and so yet again there was ambiguity among people as to how they felt about him. An amnesty was almost given to the brothers if they handed themselves in but it didn't happen. What did happen was the murder of Daniel Askew, the man the brothers thought had helped the agents. The gang was on the loose again, but now it seemed karma was catching up to them. On September 7, 1876, a failed bank robbery in Northfield, Minnesota led to the end of most of the gang. They'd savagely beat a cashier, but the cashier didn't falter in his lie and he insisted he didn't know the combination of the safe. More minutes passed and the gang members outside were getting restless as locals peered over them. As the alarm was raised, two of them were shot dead and another was injured. Inside, an unarmed cashier was shot in the head. The gang got on their horses and fled on the way killing another innocent man, a Swedish immigrant named Nicholas Gustafsson. His English was likely not good enough to understand that the Jameses were telling him to get out of the way. The gang split up some time later only for one man to be killed by the militia. The three remaining younger brothers were later arrested. It's said they actually became model prisoners, with one of them founding the longest running prison newspaper in the US. Now there was just James and Frank left. They stayed hidden in Nashville, Tennessee. Together they farmed. Frank seemed content, but almost three years later, Jesse felt the need to turn to crime again. He started a new gang, but after successful train, post office, and stagecoach robberies, the authorities were back on him. Back they returned to Missouri. In July of 1881, they robbed a train and killed the conductor and a passenger. The second train robbery would be his last. This time, the safe was empty, so they robbed the passengers. So much for a Robin Hood. James knew only too well that at any moment he or his family could be set upon by the authorities or someone looking to claim a reward. For that reason, he asked his new gang members Charlie and Robert Ford to move in with him and help out his protection. This would be his downfall, trust. Robert Ford had secretly been talking to the Missouri governor Thomas T. Crittenden. Ford had earlier been arrested and had made a pact with the authorities to take James down. He wanted his freedom and he wanted his reward. $5,000, about $130,000 in today's money. On April 3, 1882, the Jameses and the Fords were getting ready to rob a bank in Platte City. They had breakfast, and upon reading something in a newspaper about another gang member being arrested, Jesse started to wear a look of suspicion on his face. Bob Ford should have known about this, but he said nothing about it. Ford sat nervously in a chair as Jesse walked past him, trying not to let Ford know he was unsettled by the atmosphere of the morning. Something just didn't feel right. Jesse then shocked Ford by laying his revolvers down on a chair, something he hardly ever did. Those guns were pretty much glued to him. Standing in the middle of the room, Jesse noticed that quite a lot of dust had collected on a picture. He went over to remove the dust with his hand, having to stand up on a chair to do it. At that moment, Ford walked up behind him and shot him behind the ear. That was it. Instant death. James was 34 years of age. It was international news. Crowds came to see the body of the outlaw they'd followed for so long in the papers. In one day, Robert Ford was convicted of murder and sentenced to death, and then immediately pardoned by the governor. In the end, he still only received a little bit of the reward, mere scraps compared to what law enforcement got. Still, it was enough to take off and entertain townsfolks from far and wide when he reenacted the murder on stage. Two years after James was shot, Charles Ford took his own life. Eight after that, a man named Edward O'Kelly walked up behind Robert and said, Hello, Bob. He then blasted Ford's throat with a double barrel shotgun, killing him on the spot. James was buried at the farmhouse where his mother later charged people for tours. She even sold pebbles from his grave. And after she'd sold them, she collected more from the stream and put them by his grave. By the time she was done, hundreds of people all over the US claimed to have a pebble or one of his belts or guns or something else. The only surviving member of Jesse's immediate family, Jesse James Jr., was later accused of robbing a train but didn't do it. His lawyer claimed that there was prejudice given who his father was. He was rightfully acquitted of the crime. On Sunday, February 20, 1910, a small column in the New York Times mentioned a witness who testified against Jesse James Jr. 12 years prior. He'd just come out and admitted he lied about James being part of the robbery. The story only took up a little more space than woman of 107 helpless from injury. The James family were yesterday's news, no longer a spectacle for the American people. Jesse James Jr. moved to California to become a lawyer, after which, in 1921, he played his father in a silent movie. In the film, James was depicted as a hero. The truth is, he was a callous thief, a man forged into a criminal by the vagaries of a difficult life wrought by the politics of the day. Now, you need to watch Australia's most notorious outlaw, Ned Kelly, or watch a video about another bad boy, Machine Gun Kelly the life and crime of public enemy number one.